What's up, everybody? Welcome to Flux Harmonic. I am David Wilson, and today we're back with another one of our streams to see what kinds of uh, cool stuff that we can build. Uh, let me actually just turn this volume down a little bit. It's bothering me. <laughs> so, yeah, um, we are back trying to uh, see if we can get any further on our... Uh, actually, I'm not showing my screen right now. It's a good thing that, that I realized that before I started talking too much. All right, anyway, here we are. So, uh, like I was saying, we're we're getting back to the project that we started on Tuesday, which is the uh, the Flux Studio, or as I've sort of renamed it now, uh, I'm calling it Flux Compose. It's sort of an, a variation on something that someone uh, suggested in the last stream. So, thank you, whoever you were, for uh, for the suggestion. Um, all right, got some people filing in here today. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, hello to Hyder, and uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I apologize. Um, and Crazy Chicken and B. Uh, Baczynski. I, I'm sorry, I know I'm butchering that too. But uh, thank you all for joining. I appreciate you being here today. Um, Hyder says, I came back just in time. My entire arch installation just got eliminated, but whatever. Well, that's that's the game we play when we're doing system crafting is that uh, there's always a chance that things can just go down burning in flames and then ruin your whole day. But it's part of the fun too because you get to figure out why it went wrong. Um, so since last time, I actually did get the code that we worked on on Tuesday checked into a GitHub repository. You can see the link here. It's uh, github.com slash flux harmonic slash flux dash compose. And that's going to have everything that we did up until the end of the previous stream. If you want to go check that out. And also after the end of this stream, I'm going to uh, commit whatever we get done today into that repository. And we're just going to continue to build there. Uh, it may be the case that, uh, oh, hi, Muhammad. Uh, nice, nice to, uh, to know your actual name there. So um uh, we will be building in that repo for the foreseeable future and in at some point we may decide to split some things out into separate repositories it really just depends on how things go whilst as we're developing this so uh, for now that's the main place to check out the code uh, and uh, to follow along if you want to also if you want you know like to make any suggestions or if you think you found a bug or something you can feel free to file an issue there uh, questions are also perfectly acceptable on that repository and um, as far as like contributions are concerned, um, I definitely wouldn't say no to minor contributions, but uh, since we're trying to build this thing from scratch on this channel, I probably won't take any major contributions to the code, though I doubt anybody's gonna try to do any major contributions at this point. So uh, just, just putting that out there, like minor contributions are totally cool. Like if you wanna like, you know, fix something that's in the readme or a documentation page, or um, even like small bugs that you might've found, that kind of thing, it'd be totally cool. All right, so uh, the first announcement that I want to make today is that I'm going to tweak the schedule for the streams just a little bit. It's not a major change. We're still going to be on Tuesday and Thursdays, but I am going to push the start time one hour forward. So it's going to start at 2 p.m. UTC and still go for three hours. So 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. UTC. Uh, the reason I decided to do this is because I just I realized it made more sense for my own personal schedule and you know facilitating some things. Uh, that need to happen on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's going to be 4 p.m. my time to 7 p.m. And I think that's probably the sweet spot for being able to get a, a solid three hours in and also fulfill my other personal responsibilities. So uh, we're going to do that next week. So this week we're on the normal time that we started with, but next week we're going to get to the new time, which is 2 p.m. UTC. Uh, hello to Appenzel and Technomag. Uh, Techn Technomag says, says uh howdy enjoyed the first episode had to catch up at 2x speed last time since i joined late so this seems a bit slow right now yeah i know people tell me that they watch uh various videos or streams of mine in uh, 2x speed uh and that sounds i don't know how you could listen to me speaking at that speed because i sometimes it's, i say certain things quickly and i don't know if you can even follow it but if you can that's great um hi to Jurg, if that's the right way to pronounce your name I think we have a spammer here. Great. Let me get this person out of here. One second here. So uh, Crazy Chicken says, what are we building? I mean, I have a good summary of that on the last stream, but the, the very, very high level summary is we're creating basically a, a creative tool set where um, you can do music, video editing, video creation, graphics creation, a lot of stuff like that all in one program. And it's gonna be driven by scheme code. So the, the core stuff is written in C and the 
uh, the control layer, basically, the one that sort of drives everything is written in Scheme. And we're going to be using, obviously, GNU Geeks and GNU Emacs as the way to facilitate the development of this. So a lot of the same stuff that we've been talking about on the System Crafters channel up until now, we're, we're sort of diving in way, way more deeply here. And we're going to put together a lot of other areas that we haven't been able to talk about on System Crafters because, you know, who wants to talk about writing synthesizers on a channel that's about, you know, crafting system configurations. So, um... You could consider this as the application of a lot of the stuff we've been talking about so far, which I think is probably going to be pretty fun uh, for all of us uh, over time. Let me actually move this chat up. I had a good suggestion last time that we should probably move this a little bit higher. Hello to Arya and Gan. Nice to see you both. All right. Uh, also, the stream latency should be a bit better this time. There's a setting YouTube gives me to to tweak that a little bit, and I, I've changed it to be more low latency. So uh, hopefully the um, responses you get from me are a little bit closer to the time when they're actually sent in the chat. We'll see how that goes. All right. So uh, with that over with, let's get on to the next uh, topic, which is uh, basically talking about what we want to accomplish today. I've been thinking a little bit more about the overall design for what we're doing uh, since last time. And uh, I want to kind of push forward with, you know, working on the graphics layer, because I think that we can get the, um, the fastest initial um, output, I guess, from that, uh, based on some of the ideas I have in mind. Hello to star seven. Um, so uh, we're going to continue with the idea or the ideas I was sort of working on last time. Uh, the sort of primary element of that is creating a retained mode rendering model. Uh, and if you weren't here last time, basically retained mode rendering is when you have a uh, client to the renderer that constructs all of the information necessary for rendering a, a scene or some something and hands it over to the renderer and then the render, renderer can decide how to render it. Uh, that is as opposed to an immediate mode rendering API where you're basically telling the uh, rendering layer exactly what to draw um, every frame all the time. So uh, the idea is that we're going to have the scheme layer sort of be the layer where we describe what we want to render. Uh, and then we pass that on to the C layer that actually does the rendering. Uh, and I think that's going to be pretty effective for what we're trying to accomplish because I don't want to write high performance code in scheme. Even though it's probably for a lot of what we're doing, I could just write it all in Scheme, but I think it's more fun to write it in a, in a native language uh, also, at least for me anyway. So um, that's basically it. Uh, yeah, and I even said it here as the next line. Describe the graphics to be rendered in the Scheme layer, and the C layer will interpret and render the uh, complete scene or, inst or instruction list uh, efficiently. And when I say instruction list, I guess there's sort of two ways you could think about this. One is that you could just give it high level objects. So let's say I wanted to have a rectangle and a circle being drawn uh, on the screen. Um, the, so the two ways you can approach that is either you have a way to create a circle and a square object and you pass that along, you have all the parameters for those set, or you have uh, a way to describe a list of things to be drawn, which don't really have their own sort of uh, independent identity. It's just a list of things to follow. It's like a recipe basically. Uh, and the renderer just takes those and renders it directly. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I think that possibly um, using a scene uh, model or what do they call it here? Yeah, like a scene graph model is probably more effective whenever we start bringing animation into the mix because you need to have some identity for a particular object to be able to say, okay, this particular object gets animated in this way over this sort of span of time. So um, I think that We'll, we'll sort of move forward with what we did so far, which is sort of the more instruction list model, uh, but we may switch really quickly over to a more scene uh, graph approach. Um, and uh, I think that will be pre pretty effective. Um, and the, the scheme layer can replace the graphics instructions at any time. And this is sort of like REPL based drawing. So the idea I have is that you're in Emacs um, or whatever editor you want to use, but for me, it's going to be Emacs and you can write the scheme code that will describe what it is that you want to draw. And there will be a preview window that's always on display showing you the current state of what you've written in the editor. And when you want to refresh that preview, you just reevaluate the whole buffer and then that gets handed, handed over to the renderer to then update the preview. And then once you're happy with what's being rendered, you could, you could then either like render it out to an image or if it's an animation, you could render it out to a video file or a GIF file, something like that. So 
um, it would give you the ability to tweak the uh, the actual description of the graphics to be drawn in real time to see the changes. You don't have to restart the program every time to see what the, what it looks like or like render out the image every time. You can just sort of interactively develop it just like you do with Emacs Lisp code, common Lisp code, scheme code, etc. So I think that's going to be really helpful for uh, you know doing live creativity and experimenting with things as these tools get more elaborate. It's going to be really awesome, I think, to start with a blank slate and just start building something up um, for an image or an animation or maybe parts of a video or anything like that. Uh, I'm really excited about what is possible with all of this. Um, also, I, I sort of alluded to this already. Animations will eventually be possible by describing changes to elements in the scene over time. Um, I've done a few different iterations of like game engines where you have animations uh, or even like um, sort of like graphical editors for keyframe animations. And I, really the way that this is going to work is you will have some sort of timeline where different objects in the scene can have their own um, placement, I guess you could say, and sort of events that happen that may have some span over time, um, like keyframes basically. So we will have to find a way to put that in the description of what's being drawn so that it's sort of like it makes sense and it's elegant and also parts of it could be generated by code so since we're going to be using scheme as a description language for all this it shouldn't just be that we are um just doing purely declarative data we should have the ability to compose things using code and potentially generate parts of the information that's being sent over to the rendering layer uh and animations included like we should be able to generate some of that stuff dynamically so for instance if you wanted to generate a sort of like a star field or something to that uh, to that effect uh you could use code to sort of generate the positions of where all the stars would be and also sort of the how they move or something i don't know but uh yeah that that should be possible and the animation system should enable that however it however it ends up working so the goal today is just to get out some uh, get some basic things rendering in a preview window, which we started trying to do last time, but we had a little bit of trouble toward the end, and then possibly try to save it to a PNG file. So if we have time, I'm going to try to figure out a way to uh, get uh, SDL to let me save out the rendered uh, surface to a PNG file. I think it's pretty easy to do that. I think SDL has a way to do that. Um, so. Once we get to that level, then it gives me the basis for being able to build on it and eventually use it for doing things like generating thumbnails for this stream or the System Crafter streams or videos. And I think that would be very useful. But then from there, we can build to animations and all other kinds of stuff. So I think it's a good sort of progression. All right. Uh, uh, hey, Christian. Uh, Christian says, I read creative composition for works of video and I had to join. Yeah. Um, that's basically the idea is I, I want to be able to do all my video creation and editing using this software rather than the stuff that I've been using so far, because honestly, I'm really tired of just clicking on things. I, I, I don't like graphical interfaces where it's very tedious. Like with OBS, if you go into OBS, let me show you. Uh, you probably know this, uh, Christian, but other to other people who don't know, like I can't, I don't know if you can see this, but there's this little red box here with tiny little handles and you have to click it and drag it. And you can very easily click things by accident and move them around can't really I mean you can commit this stuff to source co control but it's not really meant for that so uh ultimately I want to have full control over everything using actual code so that uh it's easier to not have these little mishaps and also be able to, to check the stuff in and the value uh evolve it over time more easily so anyway I think it's going to be pretty cool once we actually start making progress uh, Technomog says, it sounds like a nice way to do tests as well. Serialize a graphics description list and reference render image and can image diff them in unit tests later for catching regressions. Yeah, definitely. Um, hadn't thought about the, uh, the image diffing, but that's certainly something that could be done. Uh, and for sure, like having like a sort of, I don't know if you really, really call it like a phased model or like a, a model where there's like an abstraction on top and then you have some lower level that handles it. But being able to generate some list of objects makes it really easy to test because you can sort of just, you know, you know what the expected output is going to be and you just, you know, uh, test the, the uh, output of the actual code against that. So testing is going to be a part of this and we're going to try to find a way to do it really efficiently so uh, we can iterate both in the REPL, you know, live coding on some parts of this, but also iterate using unit tests to uh, have a lot more faith in the accuracy of the code that we're writing. So 
Uh, we'll be writing t unit tests both in C and Scheme as we go. I, I don't really know exactly how I'll do that yet. I've done some unit testing in C before. I know it's certainly possible. Uh, scheme, I think there's a library in Guile Scheme for unit testing. So we, we have all the tools necessary. We just have to sort of figure out the right strategy and sort of the right granularity for testing, I think. Hello, T. All right, so the tasks. More specifically, what I'd like to accomplish today. Um, so I, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, I started off calling this Flux Studio, but now I'm going to call it Flux Compose. And uh, I need to rename some things in the project. That The GitHub repository already is named Flux Compose, but I need to change like the, the output of the program, or sorry, the output of the build to be Flux Compose and some other just you know small things here and there. So we'll do that really quickly to get started. Um, then also... Um, we had some trouble last time with the init graphics function in the C layer. We were basically trying to wrap it with a scheme function and call it to invoke the preview window with SDL to be able to see the output of what we're rendering. Uh, but I had a hard time actually getting it loaded up correctly into um, scheme to the point where it could be called from within a scheme module that I defined. Some kind of weird issue, probably a namespacing issue somehow. Um, and I was doing some research on that earlier today. And the more I looked into everything, the more I decided that instead of trying to write um, scheme function wrappers in C for C functions, I should actually try to use the foreign function interface for Guile to just call directly into C functions because I think it's actually going to be a lot easier to use. Um, Guile actually has a, some pretty sophisticated uh, foreign function interface APIs and also the ability to directly manipulate memory uh, that has been um, allocated with C. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to be able to do some of the things I want to do without having to have a thicker intermediate layer. We could just basically um, declare the bindings to the C functions and just call them directly. So uh, what I might try to do today um, is to create a shared library, which is sort of a, a requirement for this approach have a shared library that's written in C and then load that up into the Guile process and then create bindings to the C functions and call them that way. And I'm hoping that's going to make things easier. I think it will also make things easier to test as well because I can have a test harness program that's able to load that library also and then invoke the functions directly to test the C layer. So uh, this seems like a better approach. I probably won't take very long to get that set up because it's just another uh, thing to put in the make file. So we'll give that a shot in a moment and see what we can get done. Uh, also, we had some issues with init graphics crashing the process. Um, maybe this will be solved by switching the, the approach to how we do things. Uh, otherwise, if it doesn't, I might try to load it up in GDB and see if I can determine why it's crashing. It's probably something stupid. So GDB should, in theory, be able to tell me pretty quickly. Uh, if you've never used GDB before, it's the GNU debugger. And it's basically just a tool for, like a command line tool for debugging programs that are compiled uh, to native code. So uh, it could be pretty helpful for this. And then lastly, we want to try to get something rendering on the screen. Um, that's pretty easy to do because all I got to do is just call a couple of functions in STL and we can render things. But we want to actually render something that's been described in C. So to render something on the screen, we need to do the next thing also, which is transmit drawing instructions to the renderer thread somehow. Uh, now that I've thought a little bit more about it, I think I have a pretty decent approach in mind for how to accomplish this basically by having some c structs that we can create from scheme and just pass it directly over and uh, every time we iterate or reevaluate basically the code in scheme we basically just uh create a new uh allocation i guess of all the objects that need to go into the c layer and then the c layer can just delete the old one and just take the new one and use it uh, we may be able to do something more sophisticated over time, like maybe do some diffing, sort of like if you if you know anything about React JS, uh, React does some diffing on the um, the totality of the things being rendered and can only update the parts that actually have changed. So sometime in the future, we could try to do something like that. But at least for now, we're just going to you know delete the whole tree and, and re-render it. Um, that, and that should make it pretty easy to not worry about threading issues because we're just handing over an allocated object and we're not touching it anymore from the scheme layer. So I think that we should be able to uh, get pretty far with that. Um, and then get back to making that basic graphics example we had working. Um, that 
was not working because we had this problem with init graphics before, but I think we got a pretty good sort of early framework to uh, get that working and also have some decent scheme code to call into to uh, to make all this happen. And uh, like I said, we're gonna tr we're gonna try to render the completed image to a PNG file. I don't know if we'll have time to get to that, but I'm setting that as sort of like a stretch goal for what we're gonna do. And uh, that's that's all for what we're gonna try to do today. So let me just uh, take a little sip of water here. If if any if at any time you have questions, please feel free to ask in the chat, and uh, I can try to answer them. And then we'll just try to to get hacking on this stuff. So. First of all, renaming the project to Flux Compose. Well, I guess more firstly than that, I think we need to get um, our Geek Shell set back up again. In fact, I think I want to add GDB to that list that we had in the manifest. So let me pop back into Code, Flux Compose, and uh, Manifest.SCM. I'm pretty sure it's GDB. I kind of wonder if I already have GDB installed. Uh, Christian says, is Guile and that SCM the entry point into the project? Uh, no, I'm actually compiling a C program that loads the Guile runtime, and then that will invoke that init that SCM script. So for the person running this, they're just running a program uh, that I created, and then that sort of has the Guile runtime running inside of it. Let's uh, let's just try running uh, Geek Shell already. Uh, let's see, not loading manifest because I'm not, I already told you you could do that. That's weird. Did I not already do? Oh, I, I renamed the directory. That's why it's complaining. Okay, let me just jump back here and then copy that and then I can paste it in. Okay, now I can run Geek Shell again. And um, nice. Uh, one of the nice things about Geek Shell is that it sort of remembers whenever you've used a particular manifest before and it's immediate basically once you do that or, or once you run it the second time. Uh, let's see. So, uh, let's see if GDB is here. Nope, not there. So, we're going to have to add it to the list. Let me just check for... Oh, come on, dude. I'm trying to, to load up the list of Geeks packages. Come on, come on. Geeks. Uh, okay, we'll do it this way. Geeks search GDB. Uh, let's actually use a regex here to make sure that's not going to give us a bunch of random stuff. GDB. Okay, cool. So we'll put uh, GDB in this list because we're going to need it. We'll exit this. We're going to run Geek Shell again. In fact, let's run Geek Shell, Shell check because it sort of suggested that as a way to make sure that nothing's leaking into uh, the environment. So here it should just install GDB as an addition to what we already had in the profile. Uh, checking sh all is good. The shell gets correct environment variables. Great. All right. I'm going to echo path really quick and see if we see anything that doesn't belong. Dot files bin npm global it's got some stuff in there that i wouldn't expect but i'm not really that worried about it because i think we're we're pretty clean right now so um for those of you who weren't here last time i'm using geeks as a way to describe all the packages that are necessary to build this code and make it really easy to create a standalone environment for compiling it and then we can just run that binary that we've compiled without much trouble uh star seven says i want to follow this project on other distributions any docker file or other readme would be cool uh, yeah, I'll give some more instructions for how to install this, but um, the best way is just going to be using Geeks if you can install Geeks with your uh, distros package manager because Geeks is sort of like Docker for software development in the sense that you can create like a container environment or more like a sandbox build environment. So um, we could try to do a Docker file, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to that later maybe. I, right, like I said in the first stream, I'm sort of trying to scratch my own itch with this stuff and I'm not going to worry too much about making it easy for other people tr to try it just yet. Uh, it's more about like how what we can build while we're on the streams. Okay, so we got that together. Uh, and now what I wanted to do is jump into the make file. I need to change uh, Flux Studio to Flux Compose. That may be the only thing I need to do. Let me check if there's anything else called Flux Studio in the project. Okay, so let me change this. I added, excuse me, I added a todo.org file also, uh, Flux Compose. And I'm going to put sort of long-term tasks that aren't really necessary in the short term. I'm just going to put them here so I don't forget them. So um, uh, you may see me adding things to this list over time. All right. So then um, I'm also going to check for Flux Studio, uh, all caps. I knew I had one instance of that. 
So let me just uh, change this a little bit. Starting flux compose. Okay. So now let's uh, run make to recompile. And I think it's done. Let's look in the bin path and see if we got it. Okay. So let me just remove that flux studio. Uh, bin slash flux studio. And then if I run bin slash flux compose, then everything works. So I get a, a beguile repl and it tells me starting flux compose here. Okay. So we can call that first task uh, done here. I'm just going to mark that one done really quickly. And uh, whenever I, why did it do that? That's weird. Like it ate the, <laughs> it ate the to do somehow. There we go. Just had to get another new line in there. Anyway, after I finish these streams, I check in all of the updates to these task lists. So you can go back and look at the show notes and see uh, what we've accomplished. So uh, try an FFI approach for calling C functions from a shared library. So the, the first step toward that is going to be creating a shared library. I probably should have it to do for that here. So uh, create a shared library for core C code. Um, and the way we'll do that is go back into the make file. And um, let's see, uh, make file build shared library. Probably just gonna be another .o potentially. I'm not an expert in make files. So this is the reason why I have to look it up. Executable and shared library. So one thing I need to, to know for sure, let me look up the, the Guile manual. Uh, Guile manual, um, native extension, what was it called? C extensions, that might be it. And there's, okay, foreign function interface. Yeah, this is the thing I don't want to do. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So so this is the previous model we were trying, which is basically to uh, create, yeah, dot so, Gon says. I think, I think you're right about that. Um, it's basically to have a uh, dot so file that you can load up, and then it's got scheme functions defined in C that you can set things up, but I don't want to go that approach. I want to have a more pure uh, C library, so... Let me see, foreign function interface, foreign libraries. Does this give me the example? There's examples somewhere about this. Foreign extensions, there we go. C source file would then need to be compiled into a shared library. Okay, so GCC dash shared dash O. Okay, so that's that's what we need to do. So let's do this, bin slash um, lib flux Dot. So we'll call it just that for now. We're not going to get too fancy with it. And we're going to change this to take, well, let's see. Main.o needs to be its own thing. So this needs to be possibly lib source. Mm, let's take a look at the file structure. I want to come up with a better approach for this. You know, I, I'll just leave it. I'm not going to get too crazy with the um, code organization for now. So what I'll do is I uh, have um, lib.c as the entry point. And then we can steal that little line there. And core uh, lib.c, whoops, I should probably fix that too. Uh, core slash lib.c. And then we also wanted um, the output file to be bin slash uh, lib flux dot so and there was the dash shared parameter I think that we need to pass to that as well so let me do that too I think I can put that right here so that should build um, a library for that and what I'll do is go back into the main dot c whoops xpf main dot c there we go and I'll just steal some of this code to put into lib dot c um, SDL will keep libguile. Maybe we don't need it. Pthread, we do we need pthread? Yeah, I think we need to do that. Yep, okay, we're gonna keep pthread here so we can start the thread from within this library basically. Uh, standard bool, I think we need that here because we're using it in the SDL functions. Just list the object file, should uh, make sure you figure out everything out using implicit rules. Uh, I'll try that in a second. Thanks for the suggestion. Let me, let me just try that out really quickly. 
Um, let me remove some stuff from here. I don't need the main function. I don't need inner main. I think I should be able to just have uh, init graphics. And in fact, I can probably make this be void and this int and this int. I should probably be a little bit more specific on the uh, size of those ints, but I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Um, is that everything? I think that, that I don't have any other scheme looking stuff in here. Okay, so I have lib.c that should be able to build. We're gonna go back to the make file. And you were saying um, just list the object files. So I need to let's see main.o. This pulls main.o. I may need to put the, the other object file here too, right? Going from Lisp to C is drastic. Ah, you know, it's part of the fun. We're, we're just trying to, to figure some stuff out here. All right, let's see. Make file a uh, shared library example. I know I should be doing this uh, a better way. Let me just see if I can quickly figure out the right way. LD flags. Okay, so all target, target, tinyxml.so, libdir, inkdir, objects. Okay, sources.cpp equals .o. So there's, yeah, there's some stuff that you can do here, it seems. And I might need to, let's see. Target objects. So we just have one target. In my case, I actually need two targets, and I think, um, I'm on spammers. Okay. So, it, I mean, I think what you're saying, Gon, is that the main.o probably is not needed, and it could probably just be built as part of this, right? So um, yeah, let me just do this right here because I don't know why I was doing the other thing before. I think that I was being misled a little bit. So I, I do need this as a separate output because Flux Compose itself is not going to directly uh, link that library in. Okay, so out bin that, all right. So bin main C, uh, we don't need this. I don't know if this is, let's, let's try this right quick and make. Uh, no, it's not, is it? All right, so oops, bin slash star. Run make one more time. Okay, bin main.c, no such file or directory. Oh, that's <laughs> that's because I need to do source slash core. All right, and then we're gonna run make again. Fatal error sdl.h, no such file or directory. I think I'm missing. Um, the libs here. Hmm. So Flux Compose itself doesn't necessarily need to be linked to uh, the SDL2. Ideally, the libflux library would not need to be linked to, to Guile. So maybe what I should do is inject this stuff in libs. And that's going right there. Okay, so package config, let's see, package config, libs, sdl2, that's gonna give me these dash l and everything. Okay, cool. So I can just drop that in uh, right here, I think, package config. I know this is kind of messy. Uh, sdl2, and for the C flags part, I'm gonna put in C flags uh, STL2. Then I can take STL2 out of both of these. In theory, we'll see if that actually ends up working correctly. Um, I think this is not right, is it? Dash C, is that gonna work correctly there? Let's try it. Oops. Okay, so still no file or directory. Let's see here, package config, C flags STL2. Does this need to be after the dash C? Ugh, 
keep hitting the wrong thing. There we go. So include sdl.h doesn't like that. Uh, dash l sdl ink path is missing. Let's see. The lowercase l. It has the lib parts. What about the, I think we just pulled up the C flags part, right? Got the include path as well. So GCC, geez, let's see. Let me take a look at what I've changed so far. Cause it, what I had before was working dash C C flags. And the C flags was here. Oh, um, LP thread I'm missing also. But that's okay. That's not really as important at the moment. Because we had that for C flags. Dash C. Source core lib C. And it's complaining in, oh, okay. My mistake. I forgot to go and take the stuff out of here that I had removed out. So let me get rid of these parts. I'm gonna get rid of all the SDL stuff. Um. Yeah, uppercase I as yeah, difficult to see with the uh, sans serif font in YouTube chat. Okay, so inner main. I don't think we're calling anything else here outside of the scope of Guile now. So let me build this again. Oops. All right, so now libguile.h, no such file or directory. So maybe I broke something on the other side, cc. Uh, yeah, c flags should be in there. I think that's why I need to put uh, C flags essentially here, right? Put C flags. Uh, init graphics that is in main.c It's calling something it shouldn't be. Okay, that's right. Let's get rid of this line. And then I think it should compile. Great. And if I look in the uh, bin folder, it only has flux compose. I wonder how I get it to um, also write out the other target. Probably all bin slash flux compose. Um, let's see. Yeah, all target. I think I could just put them individually, right? Bin slash uh, lib flux dot so. Cool, that didn't seem to work. Oh, graphis thread handle. You know, sometimes whenever I type in Emacs, it just deletes random characters. I think it's just the the, the coding patterns or the typing patterns I use. So uh, is anybody having trouble with uh, the stream at the moment? Let me check. Okay, yeah, for some reason on uh, the screen I'm watching on the side, it, it stopped uh, running. I think it's fine though. Okay, so we're back to it here. I need to go back to, was it main.c? All right, let's get back here. All right, main.c. And, um, nope, excuse me, that was lib.c. And now I go to graphics, graphics thread handle, okay. Great, and if I look in the bin folder, now we have both, good. And also if I do LDD um, bin slash lib flux, uh, I don't have permission because is LDD needed special parameters or is it LLD? No, LDD help. Could have sworn. LDD bin slash flux compose. Not a dynamic executable. What are you talking about? Did I do something wrong? Let's try this uh, bin slash flux. Where am I? Compose. Okay, so something is wrong with those uh, binaries now. They're not executable, which means somehow uh, they didn't get written out correctly. I'm guessing. Chmod x uh, bin slash flux compose. Bin slash flux compose. Yeah, exec format error. Something is wrong here. This may be a mistake. Yeah, okay, so it's it's binary stuff. Let me double check what I'm doing here. Objects. Do I have another tab open? I think this one was the one I was looking at. 
Oh, no, that's not the right one. Shared dash O. Oh, it's nice to see that I broke everything. I think I'm missing P thread also. Drop the dash, drop the dash C option. UCC help. Probably it's got a huge list. Dash C, compile and assemble, but do not link. Ah, you're right. Thank you. So I need to link, because otherwise these are just um, object files. So, okay, thank you. God, you you uh, you always know the answer. I appreciate that. There was something else. I need to also add um, LP thread here, because otherwise we won't have P thread access. Let's take that out here, because that process doesn't specifically need it. I'm gonna run make one more time. I can just type it. Nothing to be un done for all. Um, maybe I should do a clean. That other page I had open had a clean example. I could just steal that really quickly. Did I see that? No, it wasn't there, was it? Nope. Okay. Anyway, I think it was just an RMRF. So if I do oh, clean RM, come on, RMRF uh, bin slash star. Is that going to work? Make clean. Missing separator. I did something wrong. I didn't like it. Okay, so um, um, make file clean. Okay. Oh, there's like a dash. So is that how you do it? Like dash rm, and then bin slash star. Bony clean. Oh boy, so you need this dot phony thing because it's not a real target. That's kind of fun. Missing separator. I'm still breaking it somehow. Let me just do this manually for now because I don't want to waste too much time on make file magic. Okay, so make still doesn't like it. Let me just delete that for a second. Okay. Um Recompile with FPIC. I think that one needed it, right? Um, the Guile example had that for this FPIC. I don't know what that does, but we're going to put it in here. Oh, the glories of the make file. Yeah, it's, um, this is the part I don't like. And usually I s try to skip it by just writing a bash script that can build everything. All right, so now if I do uh, bin slash flux compose, all right, we're back there. If I do LDD bin slash lib flux SO, I see that we have um, Wayland, uh, EGL, X11, all the stuff that's probably needed for SDL. So yeah, SDL2 is there. So that seems right. Everything's built, it should be okay. So now um, what I need to do is in the init maybe load extension init math vessel okay so the normal way for an extension to be used is to write a small scheme file that defines a module and to load the extension into this module when the module is auto loaded the extension is loaded as well so we may need to do individual uh files to put things in different scheme modules it kind of sucks um if we have to do that do it that way but we're gonna wait for a second and and see how it goes before we uh, invest too much in that direction um but look, we can just try to start doing this uh we, we're not gonna do wait hold on init math vessel so it can call this function which is cool but i needed to do something else i'm gonna use uh foreign libraries approach, I think. I'm trying to make this a little bit. Come on, can you zoom in? There you go. Loading foreign libraries and accessing their contents. Load foreign library. There was an example I saw this somewhere. To define procedures. Yeah, I don't want to do that. It gave me like there was a really good suggestion. 
Ah, yeah, this part right here is what I had read. Uh, and yet, if what we want is just the JO function, it seems like a lot of a lot of ceremony to have to compile a guile specific wrapper library complete with an initialization function wrapper module. There is another way, uh, but to get there, we have to talk about function pointers and function or in function pointers and function types first. See foreign functions and skip to the good parts. So, uh, this is what I had in mind. Yeah, this is the code that I remembered. Cool. I think this is the right thing because I can pull any uh, symbol from the C library into whatever module I want, I believe, by doing this. Because what you're basically doing is you're defining a symbol in the scheme library that pulls in the foreign library function from some library that's um, accessible somehow. I need to figure out what path it looks into. And then the name of the function and also you have to pass in the return type of the function and the argument types so uh guile is able to understand how whatever you pass in here maps to actual c function what do they call it the c abi the uh, application binary interface and it's able to uh call directly into the c code by uh, you having de defined this mapping here so we can define a mapping directly into that init graphics function by doing this and we can call the function whatever we want. We can put it in whatever library we want. So I think this gives us a pretty good level of flexibility without some of the more complex stuff we were thinking about doing the last time. So uh, let's do this. I'm gonna pull this code in. Um, we're gonna go into, was it uh, graphics.scm? So let's delete that line and delete that part right there. We're gonna move this export down here. I probably got some uh, mismatch going on. I think I got that text right there. So now I can define a knit graphics or I can call it whatever I want really. Uh, we're gonna say this is gonna be in, I hope it pulls it from the same folder as a binary. That would be really helpful if it did. Uh, lib flux uh, init graphics return type I, mean, I need to look up the signatures for this. I think it's uh, I think void is is fine. Void pointers and byte access. We don't need void pointers. We just need void. Uh, it gets a little bit um, foreign types. There we go. Float double void. Okay, cool. Void type. So void and argument types. Uh, let's look at the argument type list. So there's an int. So I can just put int here. Just int and uh, int because init graphics returns nothing and it takes in a width and a height if you look at this uh, right here. So in theory, that should be enough to bind to that init graphics function provided that um, it's able to find that shared library whenever it when this uh, foreign library function gets called. So we can actually try to build this. Or in fact... We don't need to build that. We could probably just try to run it straight up now. So I'm going to run uh, Geyser to pull up. Uh, that's the wrong one. Pull up Flux Compose. Definitely the wrong one. Let me just double check this really quickly. We need to check the uh, Geyser. Oh, he lift dear. Uh, geyser Guile Binary. Okay, that is set incorrectly i need to fix that now so i need to go into i'm surprised i didn't find that file actually dot dear locals and then change this to flux compose so basically what i'm doing is telling geyser the it's basically like slime for for scheme uh it gives you the, the ability to run a repl and do a lot of uh development functionality um using emacs and i'm telling it where to find my program that has scheme functionality or sorry a, a scheme repl in it a guile repl guile repl so let's say run geyser again uh no such no such file or directory oh i need to change the uh directory path as well in that file dear locals not, not open still so let's see oh i need to reset that that's the problem okay Default directory, flux compose. So I need to uh, run normal mode on this file maybe. And then run geyser. Okay, so flux compose, source modules, flux. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm not sure what the best way to get the path where the dear local file is. 
I need to figure that out because it's going to be a headache otherwise. Emacs um, git directory where dear locals is found. Dear locals find file to get the directory containing. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you use dear locals find file, does it just return it? Dear locals find file. Find the directory local variables for file. Um, no, that doesn't seem right, does it? I don't know, that doesn't sound right. File name directory or load file name, buffer file name. Uh, no, don't think so. Um, That is probably the right way to do it. So use projectile project root, or in my case, uh, I think it's what, project root? Project root, yeah. I could just call project root, project root. Uh, wrong number of arguments. Project. Current. Project instance and directory. Project root. Roots. There is a way to do this. Project directory. I swear there's a, a way to... Oh, prod... No. Project current... Project find functions. Mm. I know there's a way to get this. Um, maybe if I look in, really? Emacs, uh, Emacs, in info index, project, project root, working with projects, Project compile, let's see. Project find file, project find, or let's, no. It's a waste of time. Uh, project find file. Let me just jump into the code really quick. I can probably find it. Root, root, project root PR. Okay, I guess I gotta just do that. Project current project root on the outside of that, which is not the most elegant approach, but whatever. Uh, where's my dear locals? Dear, no, 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 come on. Dear locals, okay, so now uh, here what I'll do is use project root and project current, and I should be able to just eval this right here to see if it gives me the right result. Okay, so that's the right one. Um, hopefully it doesn't need to be fully expanded. I think I can do that if I need to, but I've forgotten what the, um, what you call it, the function is for that. That's no big deal though. All right, so let's get back to it. I'm gonna go back into graphics.scm. I'm gonna run normal mode to reeval the dear local variables, and then I'll run uh, run geyser. Okay, so at least it ran it from the right place. It exited with status one though, which is kind of interesting. Now, um, let me see if I can go into eShell potentially, and then I don't have the same buffer local variables though. So guys are binary. Let me steal that really quickly. I'll go into eShell. Uh, I'm going to run this directly. Oh, it's fine. Maybe I do need to expand that path. Wouldn't surprise me. Um, let's see, file absolute, file name absolute, oh. God, I can't remember, Emacs resolve absolute path, or Emacs lisp, I should know this function, I made a video about this, 
Crazy Chicken says, I just looked up Geyser at this very moment to see if I could recommend anything. Yeah, it, it's, um, ah, look, my own show notes shows up here. Okay, so expand file name. I should have remembered that. So expand file name. Okay, cool. Um, we'll go back to dear locals and we're, we're just going to try to see if it works. Um, when you put this on the outside, expand file name, and then we can wrap, ah, lispy mode. It needs to be turned on. Dude, really? Wrong type argument. What are you talking about? Okay. We'll put that right there. We'll indent that a bit. Uh, and do we have matching? Okay, cool. Let's go back into graphics. I know this seems like a waste of time, but um, it's going to be useful for not driving us insane when we're trying to restart the REPL from arbitrary files. Oh, come on, man. Exited with status one. I'm doing something wrong. I can run it just fine. Yeah, that works. I wonder if it's sending some parameter that, uh, that it doesn't like. Uh, what am I doing in my init file, maybe? init.scm? Okay, so I'm not actually um, loading anything. Let's think for a second. Maybe what I'll do, just to see if the function that we pulled in works, I could try um, bin slash flux compose. Okay, let's go back to vterm. Let's, oh, hmm. Nah, that's probably not it. Okay, so let me think. bin slash flux compose and then give it the example slash basic graphics all right so it crash wrong type to apply let's see where does it get that warning <clears throat> fail to creep okay i don't care about that expand top sequence okay i think i have some kind of syntax issue in my module let's try that out really quickly some oh prefix license why is that even in here geeks licenses what am i oh why did i do that okay use module use module that should be fine um hmm show preview window did i bungle that what about the end maybe it maybe it ate something lispy likes to eat for uh parentheses sometimes Let's move it on. Oh, lisp. Ugh, Jesus. Uh, scheme mode. Lispy mode. Disabled, enabled. Okay, so at least it works correctly here. Check parents. Okay, so something weird is happening. Let me just take this part out really quickly and see if that solves it. Unbound variable init graphics. Okay, so let me do that too. Uh, source expression failed to match any pattern in form. I think it's because I don't have a body in this function. Display blah. That uh, should be saved. Render graphic. Where is that? Unbound variable render graphic. Oh, that's probably in the basic, basic graphics. Render graphic. I did. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I didn't actually export that from here, so let's put that here. Render graphic. Is that what I called it? Okay. Okay, all right. So we're back to where things are actually going to work if that function would pull in fine. So I think for some reason, maybe it's the way that I'm, um, I'm calling this. Maybe there's something wrong with the way that I'm calling it. So let's jump back to the docs foreign library function return type double oh that okay i forgot list right there 
never complain about make files. Why? Because they're, they're just going to give me more trouble. All right, DL open. This is what I expected to see at some point. So it can't resolve the path to uh, libflux.so. Um, you would think that it would be looking in the same directory where the uh, executable is, but I can't really expect it to be that smart. So maybe there's a way I can add another path or is this gonna be just an issue where it's it's going to be at the, at the process level. I'm going to have to have the right paths um, exposed to it through environment variables. That's going to be a little bit of a pain if we have to do it that way. I might have to... I wonder what directory it's using as the current directory when it's, it's trying to resolve the file path. So I can try to write out, was it like current directory or something? Actually, let's uh, let's let's try this one more time. I actually want to run Geyser and see. Ah, uh, I need to take this. Ah, uh, let's do it the right way. Run Geyser. I really don't know why it's telling me it's exiting with status one. It must be invoking it in some way that uh, it doesn't like. Oh, well, that's wrong. This should be an underscore. That's not the problem. All right, so cannot open shared object file. So if I were to uh, try to update the library path, let's say I did this. I think this would help. Equals um, li library path colon First of all, does library path have anything in it? Library path. I don't think so. Oh, okay, it does. All right, cool. So what I want to do is library path equals, I think there's a, there's a shorthand for this that I'm missing. Library path colon uh, home David Will projects code flux compose slash bin. Uh, cannot open shared object file, no such file or directory. If I did that right, it, it could be the LD library path that actually needs to happen for that. So let's try that really quickly. LD library path. Ah, okay. So that worked. Um, interesting. So the question is, can I compile in the link to that library path? I think I can, right? Does it get stored in the executable? Yeah, thanks, Gun. Huh. Or right, let's let's continue to look at this really quickly. Maybe there's a way. Um, or is it really just a matter that I'm going to have to give an absolute path there for that function, the foreign library function function? Close the address of name from lib. Treat it as a function making arguments. Let's let's try giving it an explicit path just for the sake of. I don't think this is gonna work, but let's try it anyway. Home slash David Will slash project slash code slash flux compose slash bin libflux dot so. And then I'll run this without setting LD library path. Okay, so that does work too. And if I were to change that back and run it like that, then it no longer works. So that does work to give it the full path. So I might just have to like find the full path. That's fine. I think we can deal with that at some point. Uh, I should probably find a better way to resolve this for now though. I don't wanna uh, be too beholden to the um, local file path of my own system. So we can do something really hacky and hopefully it can resolve the relative path. So I can say um, dot dot, slash dot dot slash dot dot i think and pull it no found file not found um so one two three slash bin i think i missed the bin didn't i yeah bin file not found um okay let's go to 
source modules flux ls dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash bin should find it right so then maybe what i can do is just uh resolve that path so maybe there's a function file scheme did i do this already i think i did canonicalize path i think that was the name of the function so let's say canonicalize path now let's jump back down and then run that canonicalize path all right so let's check knit.scm because i think it's there canonicalize path did i not write that correctly canonicalize path hmm oh it can't find it either i wonder if it's actually running it from the context of the uh project root directory yeah okay uh gone says does it look in well-known locations like user local lib it probably does i think it's just pulling from uh ld library path okay so, well this is good enough for now i probably should add a little uh to do uh don't uh use a brittle path to load the library so um now init graphics should be callable but the problem is let's see it has a zero exit code so it didn't crash but also didn't do anything let me go back to the uh basic graphics example I'm calling show preview window and show preview window is calling um init graphics hmm and, and excuse me init graphics is calling init graphics thread which creates a thread but it doesn't wait so maybe yeah I don't really want a preview window to show up whenever you're running it like batch mode anyway. So I guess we're back to the problem of trying to figure out how to make it uh, run the REPL again. So let me once once more try run geyser. Why all of a sudden do you decide to work? Uh, no, it's not right. Why did it run the wrong geyser? I could tell because there's a string I'm writing out and if it's not there, I know it's not running the right uh, REPL. So let me actually run uh, normal mode file mode specification error void function ccls what are you talking about uh geyser guile binary yeah it's got the wrong binary here i wonder why this file isn't loading up the is it because of ccls error why is it running sly in this buffer anyway oh i turned it to lisp mode that's why this needs to be fundamental mode, right? No. Dear locals mode. I have no idea. Let's kill this buffer really quickly. And then reopen dear locals. Okay, lisp data is the type for this buffer. And what was I trying to do? Go back to lib.c and figure out why. Yeah, it's, it's not bound to any specific mode, so it should have been applying it to this mode. Ah, whatever, let's just do this run geyser exited with status one i wonder if it also doesn't have the geyser implementation set right okay see implementation guile that's really strange i don't know what is happening with that right now did i change anything in main.c I guess let's uh, take anything out that's unnecessary. I think we're back to plain old plain old stuff here. We have libguile.c. Uh, we'll run make. Nothing to be done. See, I don't know why it thinks nothing needs to be done because the source file changed, unless it's because the, uh, the targets, it's not actually paying attention to the targets anymore. I check the stream health, okay. Let's see.
That's interesting. I uh, will clean it anyway. So uh, RM bin slash star make. Okay, so now um, let's try running it one more time. Did you get the right one? I don't think you did. No, of course not. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. Go back to graphics.scm. I really need a better way to initiate this. Why did it not do the right thing here? That's strange. In this buffer, geyser guile binary is the right one. Oh, I stopped loading init.scm, didn't I? That's freaky. I must have done something wrong in init.scm. What is in init.scm? Source modules. Okay. Ah, you know what? It probably can't find source slash modules. That must be what it is. That must be what it is. Okay. I, I understand now. It, that's very tentative. I would have to, so I'll, I'll tell you, let me just explain what's happening so that you understand, uh, so that it doesn't seem like I'm just talking to myself. In the init file, I am calling uh, add to load path canonicalize path source slash modules. And I think it's using the current directory, the current working directory from which this uh, program is being run to canonicalize this path. And it's not doing it relative to the location of um, the project or the binary. So to do this correctly, we would have to somehow locate the right path to source slash modules, regardless of where the executables run from. Um, so let's see, to do make this more robust. In fact, I think I need to be adding these to the to actual to-do list. Let me go to the to-do.org file. Uh, make um, init.scm loading more tolerant to um, process start location a uh, current working direct working directory okay and then there was another thing i had it to do for it was in graphics at scm which is let me just actually make that as a to do also in fact i'll, I'll add that back so in to do.org we'll add this to say um don't use a brittle relative path to load lib flux so so these are some things we could do another time. I might pull them into the next stream. It really just depends. I, I would like to, for us to start making progress toward the actual goals and not be dealing with little infrastructural problems like this for a long time. All right, so now um, the short-term solution is just to make sure that we're trying to run the REPL from the Flux Compose path. So in this case, I'm just gonna run, run Geyser and it seems to work, to work. Okay, didn't work. Very interesting. Oh, that's because I need to be pulling that file back in. Okay, so let me just pull this into main.c. I'm gonna start loading init.scm again. That's the reason why it kept crashing from that location is because I was loading init.scm and then it had an error, but we just didn't get the output. So now if I were to remake this, which we need to be able to force that because right now it's not detecting, it needs to be remade. Um, and if I go back into, let's say this file, mm, yes. And then I run run geyser, Jesus, no, no such file or directory flux studio. Ah, uh, normal mode. Need to reload the dear local variables, run geyser, boom. Okay. And that should have the banner text at the top right there. Okay. So we're back in now. Thank God. Uh, guile repl, we're going to move that there, close that window. Now, um, here's what we'll do. We'll go and load up the examples file, basic graphics.scm, and then we're gonna eval the buffer. So what is it? Geyser eval buffer. Okay, control C, control B, control C, control B. All right, so we now have a window that popped up, which is excellent. That's really good news because it actually means that we were able to 
uh, invoke that C method directly from scheme code, uh, which is great because now we have a way to easily call into C code to do things like render stuff. So I think we're actually going to make some progress this stream. I'm kind of excited now that I've seen this happen. Um, I think. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. If I kill the window, I can't need to kill the whole REPL to do this uh, over and over again. Why is it pulling up a debug page? Interesting. Okay, it didn't have a problem. I think it's just writing the, uh, the the output, which it doesn't have any output. So I'm gonna kill that uh, REPL. Guys are gone binary. I wish that whenever you ran the REPL, it would remember the value of that variable so you could just hit Control Z, Control Z again. Why is this? Let's see, default directory. The default directory is the right path. I wonder why this isn't picking up uh, dear local variables. That's a problem for another time. Okay, so. Um, next step, let me actually go mark that off the list. So we've created a shared library for core C, C code, which is cool. I, I don't know why. I think it's because I'm using this inside of the... Um, let's do this, actually. Yeah, I think... Uh, the presentation mode is what's causing the problem here. Kill panel. All right. Try an FFI approach for calling C functions. Uh, that definitely works. And this is no longer crashing the process, which is great. Uh, so we may not need to actually use GDB this time, but I'll leave this here for now. So now, really, we just need to get something drawing on the on the screen. So let's go back to uh, lib.c. And then um, in our render loop, let's just start by clearing the screen. So uh, SDL to clear screen. I think it's just a fill operation, but I don't remember at the moment. Render clear. Okay, that's good enough. I think this is if we're using um, the render library, which we haven't done yet. So let me... Okay, so this actually... A example which is great because I kind of want to use renderer let me do a little I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and try to look to see if SDL to renderer save to PNG let's see if there is actually a function for that I feel like renderer doesn't let you do that maybe it does texture render target ah so you can just render to a separate texture with the same APIs Set render target, query texture. Okay. Well, there we go. I think that's going to be pretty easy. So I'm just going to drop this um, answer. Over. Come on. I think if I just, uh, hold on. Click that. Yank, yank. Then I'll go back to the notes. And... Drop that right there, because we'll just go look at that again whenever it's time to do that. All right, so now we're going to go back to this render clear. This gives us a little example of how to do a main loop where we're rendering to a window. So we're going to create a renderer. We're going to set the render draw color, which is going to allow us to fill. Uh, renderer clear. Uh, render present, which is going to... It's basically double buffering, so we're just going to put the back buffer onto the screen. And then... Um, I don't know why they're delaying. That doesn't make any sense, but we're just going to copy this part of the code so we can uh, put it on the screen and drop it in our code, basically. So we'll start by putting this right here because we need to set up the renderer first. I need to have an actual renderer stored first. SDL renderer. And... Um, SDL set render color. In my case, I want to set it to black. Um, yeah, because because right now it's an empty window. Like you're just seeing the background of the window, so it's kind of boring. Set the fill color to black. Uh, create the renderer for the window. Uh, 
create the preview window. I probably need to break this down so we're not creating the window all the time. Um, okay, clear the screen before rendering. And then this, so these two things need to be inside of the while loop, I think. So we'll do that. We're just gonna drop these right in. Well, no, actually, let's put it right here. We're gonna do it after checking events because what we want is to make sure that um, if we need to quit the application, we're not gonna waste the cycle rendering. And we're gonna change this here as well because we need to make sure that we have the right context set before we try to clear the screen. So uh, set the fill color, color to black, render clear, render present. Uh, flip the back buffer. Okay. And that should be enough to at least start uh, clearing the screen. So if I can rebuild everything here, if I go back to our V term and then run, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. Remove bin slash star and and make. All right, so window. What did I miss with window? Screen. Let's call this window. Screen. Is that called screen anywhere else? Nope. All right, do this now. Okay, so that got built. And uh, now we're going to run. Yeah, I still need to run that from wherever init.scm is. Yeah, this is going to get annoying really quickly, I think. Uh, okay, I think it's fine. Now we're going to go into... Uh, let's see, basic graphics at SCM. We're going to eval this buffer, which is control C, control B. Oh, okay. So apparently I made it yellow somehow, which is not what I expected, but uh, it's a result, which is good. Why is it yellow? I must not have changed something correctly. They just put it red in um, ah, 25. That explains why. Okay. So it's doing what I expected it to do. It's It's clearing the screen, which is good. Okay, so I need a way to quickly iterate on changes to the native layer without uh, pulling my hair out, having to do five different steps every time because it's going to be really boring for me and really boring for you. So ideally, what would happen is if I close the preview window, it would just kill the whole app. I think that here in the case of whenever uh, SDL quit, uh, I think if you close the window, I think SDL quit will be uh, sent as an event. I'm not 100% positive about, about that, but it should happen. And if it does happen, then um, maybe, there's not a way to know for sure. Let me think about that for a second. I need some kind of callback, I think, for the closing of the preview window. Something that the scheme layer can hook into and basically say, oh, whenever, uh, whenever the, the preview window is closed, just abort. I'm trying to think of a good way to do that. But first, let's actually see if what I think is true. Uh, include standard io.h. We're just gonna print a message out whenever the quit event is hit. And I will we'll try something out if it doesn't actually show up. Printf um, quitting SDL window. Probably just use printf in. That should be enough. So let me go back into vterm. Uh, did I kill the... No, I didn't kill Geyser yet. Let's uh, kill the session. Um, we'll run make, and then we'll go back to init.scm. We will run Geyser. We'll go back to the example file. See, this is why I need a, a quicker way to do this because this is kind of stupid. Uh, and then I will eval the buffer, control C, control B. Uh, oh, okay, I'm, obviously I should be rendering 000 if I want it to be uh, black. But I'm rendering white, which makes sense giving, given what I passed in as values. I'm gonna press, uh, I'm gonna close this window. Ah, hmm. I'm not getting process output here because it doesn't come through. 
<laughs> to the lair of of geyser is there a way to find the process output uh guile mm, process probably a hidden buffer yeah okay that was not the right way to do that let me think for a second If I can pass a pointer to a scheme function that has no parameters into um, init graphics as a callback for when the window gets, gets closed, I might be able to take the process down. Uh, or I could probably just call the exit function. You know, that's a cheap way to do it, but honestly, cheap is good at this moment. So if I can call, let's see, is it just exit zero? Um, C exit function. I'm pretty sure that is a thing you can do. Yeah, let's see library function exit. Terminates the calling process immediately. Okay. So let's try it. What we're going to do here is uh, run exit. I think you get the exit code as a parameter. Yep, status code. Let's get that out of there. And uh, let's see if it works before we leave any kind of note here. Uh, what library is that in? Probably probably standard lib, right? Just copy this. Drop it right there. I kind of like having the standard libraries first. So I'm just going to put those like that. Whoops. And um, we should be able to find out. And also, eh, let's just try this really quickly. V term. Um, we will do that. Go back to init, run geyser, um, go into basic graphics.scm, run the buffer. Forgot to change the color there, that's okay. We'll fix it. If I close this, yes, it worked, great. Okay, so I could tell that it worked because it told me that uh, it's been nice interacting with you, which basically means the process died. Yeah, it's not letting me type anymore. Cool. So that's enough to quickly bail out. And it's a temporary measure for now. We're not going to leave that in there forever because that would be terrible. So let's uh, just say for now, find a better way to uh, tell the scheme, scheme side to exit gracefully. This is going to come back to bite us, I'm quite sure. Whenever we write uh, tests or something, it's probably going to be a nightmare. Man, I don't like the indentation level they had in these examples. Is this what actually Emacs has as an indentation level for C? What is the K and R C? Whoops. Uh, Kern again, Richie. Um, C formatting. Is it two spaces or four spaces? Oh, come on. Indentation style. KNR style. I saw it right there. They don't say anything about width. Whoa, what did I just do? Width. Um, many editors developing a KNF style cope well with a GNU style when the tab width is set to two spaces. Four? Ugh. I don't like four spaces. I guess I've been writing JavaScript code too long, but also, I mean, Lisp code typically has uh, two spaces for special forms. What is this? Ah, that's interesting. Let's close this window. Okay. Same line open brace. Yeah, for sure. I think I'm more used to that now too, just from uh, too much JavaScript. So I'll probably just put that there and that. I don't like so many uh, lines, I guess, open. Okay, so um, so we're, we're bailing out quickly now whenever we close the preview window, which is good. And I need an easy way 
to run the REPL again. And one thing I could do is just set up my own key binding to launch it from the correct default directory from, directory from anywhere. That might be enough. So it might be time to think about just starting up a very, very simple uh, Emacs Lisp package for uh, working with this project. Let me see, what do I have here? Hmm. I'm trying to think of the right folder structure to put a, a, a basic set of Emacs Lisp code in here. Probably like misc or something. I mean, that's kind of lame, but maybe it's good enough for now. Misc. Or tools. How about that? Let's call it tools. Uh, rename Mr. Tools. And then um, we'll call this uh, fluxcompose.el. So we're going to have a defund of uh, flux compose start REPL. I think I'm writing scheme code right now. Let's take that out of there. And then um, I want to have, let's see, add file local variable prop line. And we're going to set uh, lexical binding to true. Control C, control C. No? Okay. Uh, normal mode. Let's make sure that's on. Lexical binding T. Good. And then um, we're going to say uh, let default directory. Oh boy, I think I can just do that, right? Yeah, it's a little bit risky, but here's what we're gonna do. We're, we're gonna do it cheaply for now, then we'll do it the right way later. Uh, we're gonna set the default directory to project root of project current, just to get the right uh, path to project when we're in that folder. And then, uh, we are going to uh, run Geyser. Uh, we also probably want to be clear about the path to the ge uh, Geyser Guile binary. And we're just going to rip off that same code from uh, dearlocals.el to set that. So by doing this, we're just going to sidestep some of the problems we were having before. Hopefully this is going to work. And um, let's see. Is control C Z bound to anything? It's kind of dangerous binding, probably. Control C R. I'm trying to find a, a binding that I can kind of uh, bind globally. It'd be nice if I could bind it in the scope of this directory. I don't know if there's a good way to do that unless I do it as a hook that gets added. For any file that's in the um, in the project path, that's probably the right way to do it. So if I were to Yeah, so I think you can set hooks in dear locals, but maybe it's just using eval like uh, the other examples we've been looking at. Oh, hold on a second. Oh, that's right. Okay. Dear locals, we have eval there. Okay. We may not need to set this anymore if we use that. So let me go back to my uh, scheme buffer. Uh, let's see what key bindings we have under control C. Uh, control C, Control R is a geyser eval region. Uh, geyser mode switch to REPL. Uh, Fickery says, I'm wondering, is it possible if you do this thing by using literate programming practice? I think that would be pretty hard, um, mainly because tangling files every time you save, I don't know, it's, it just becomes a headache. But if you have suggestions to that end, I'm I'm certainly willing to hear them. All right, edit module, add the path, blah blah blah. 
Okay, so there's a lot of other random stuff at the direct letter layer. Projectile, anything else? Oh, what is the end stuff? My stuff, okay. So probably just a control C with a single letter of some sort. Control C R, maybe. Control C R. Mm. Not ideal, but it could work right now. <coughs> excuse me. So uh, we're going to do something just, excuse me, <coughs> something really cheap. Or is it global set key? Global set key. Uh, keyboard. Uh, control C R. And we're going to bind that to, whoops, we're in the wrong file for this. Let me take that out here and put it back into Flux Compose. Whoops, wrong place also. Boom, right there. We're going to put that to Flux Compose to start REPL. And that should be enough. Let me go back and clean this file up a little bit. And if I um, eval this buffer, then um, Control C R. Wrong. Okay, this needs to be a command. All right, so interactive. We will reevaluate this and then Control C R. Wrong number of arguments. Run geyser. I think it needs to be called interactively. Okay, so call interactively run geyser. Let's try uh, control C R one more time. Great. And this is actually running from the right place. Seems so. So uh, that's good. I think um, that might save us some headaches. So the idea is now I should be able to go just straight back to basic graphics, control C, control B, see it get started up. When, I've, when I'm happy with what I see, I can hit uh, super Q to kill that window because that's what I have EXWM set up to do. And now this is going to be killed. And now if I want to start it up again, I can be anywhere. I can be in, let's say, graphics.sem and run control C, R, and then it should start up correctly again. So that's already helped a good bit. Let's go back and add that to um, um, get the screen clearing. We got that done. Um, find a faster way to iterate on the native layer. Got that done. This thing will move down here to the bottom because we may not need to deal with it today. Hopefully. All right, so now let's see if we can get something rendering on the screen. So maybe the quickest way to get this started would be to try to just, you know, write some C code to render something and then find a way to then uh, pipe a similar instruction from scheme to C and then render it from the data instead. So SDL2 renderer, I think there's some drawing routines in there we can use for some very, very basic um, drawing functionality. You know, this wiki, I don't know if I'm just not used to it anymore. I thought it used to be better. Maybe it's fine. Category renderer. Okay. Uh, let's see. Single pixel lines, single pixel points, filled rectangles, texture images. I think there's also an SDL uh, draw library. Is that what it's called? SDL draw. Drawing lines with SDL2. Let's take a look at this i guess the last updated in uh, 2002 i don't think that works with sdl2 yeah we may have to go with a more custom approach for non-trivial stuff sdl2 draw and fill shapes oh it's sdl2 graphics sdl2 gfx um is there anything in the wiki about that Draw a filled circle. Yeah, go to the answers here. Mr. Bill says they changed it some time ago. Yeah, you mean like the, the drawing library for SDL? For sure. Okay, let me um, SDL wiki GFX. Do they have a section for that? They must have a section. Zoom in, please. Migration guide, okay. That's not really what I want to look at, but. Um, search. GFX, I don't know. Example with SDL2 GFX. 
Oh man, come on. I need to know what the function signatures are so I can actually find the right stuff. So let's implement Bresenham's drawing algorithm and scheme. Probably would end up implementing it in C. Uh, okay, well, this is a clone or mirror. That's not right. Let's take a look at the actual. Ugh. Okay, so they're probably using something completely different now. Free software directory. Give me the. Uh, okay, some other time. That's a tar GZ. Where is the. There it is. Source Forge, really? Who's using that these days? Do not accept. See, SourceForge is just turned into a cesspool. I mean, I think they've probably reversed some of the stuff they were doing before, but it got really, really bad with like all the ads and crap. Okay, so source. Well, let's take a look at the images here. They can do some stuff. That's cool. That's some very um, 1990 looking text rendering though. Where is the repo? code the site is not very well organized uh branches whatever okay that's a waste of time 2d accelerated rendering uh is gfx mentioned here no graphics okay i know the package is in, is a uh, part of geeks so let me actually just go to the manifest ah, i already have it pulled in that's good useful Mr. Bill says, uh, I mean the wiki. Yeah, I was using it last year. I think maybe just because um, I'm using Cute Browser with a dark theme, I don't recognize how it looks anymore because everything's dark, unlike the way it used to be whenever it was all white pages. So maybe I just don't remember, excuse me, I don't remember what it looks what it looked like before. Okay, so we have SDL2 graphics already set up um, in the development environment. I would like to figure out how to use it. So maybe there's like an SDL draw set of functions. I know that's probably not the right thing, but no. SDL graphics. Binding to a little bit of SDL GFX. Okay, this is, that's fine. I can look at some API docs Maybe that's what I should be doing. Uh, SDL2 GFX, let's say Rust. Rust usually has good um, documentation for crates. Here we go. I just need to know what the function signatures look like so I can search for those. Primitives. Uh, set font? Is that all? Okay, image filter, that's kind of useful, but I need like literal drawing of primitives, like circles and stuff like that. I thought it provided those things. Frame rate control, FPS manager, I like that. Cool. Frame rate uh, code is a pain sometimes to deal with. I had an algorithm I was using for it in the past and uh, I wasn't really that crazy about it, so. So let's see, here's an example of using the Rust library. <clears throat> I know it's ridiculous that I have to do this, right? SDL2 pixels, uh, SDL2 primitives, Jesus. Sometimes the key bindings eat me. Come on. Draw renderer. Really? Is that a submodule? Pixels color RGB canvas.line. What is canvas? Canvas window into canvas build. <clears throat> Set draw color. All right, there's some stuff here that doesn't look like what I expect. So, uh, SDL2 GFX draw renderer. <clears throat> I know I'm wasting a little bit of time here, but uh, we probably need to figure this out. Is that something only named like that in the Rust library? That's not fun. Twenty-five 
2016. Okay, there's some docs here. Graphic primitives. Okay, here we go. Some header files. The functions are in there. Ah, here we are. Okay, so that makes some sense. This is in SDL2 GFX primitives.h. Box color, rounded box, uh, anti alias lines. That's nice. Circles, arcs, polygons. Nice. Uh, Bezier curves. I like that. Draw a character of the currently set font. Okay. Font rotation. This could be pretty useful. So um, I think we can give this a shot. And uh, maybe the higher level docs could tell you like conceptually how to use it. Uh, a test programs in the test folder. Where, where is the code? Is that really the last release? It's like 2014, 2015? Uh, 2018. I mean, that seems reasonable, but I still can't find the code. I just need to know what the entry points are. Branches. Tr okay. Is it trunk that I need to be in? Okay. There we go. Um, docs. Did they say there was a, an example file somewhere? Nope. So STL2 GFX. Is there a core header you can pull in doesn't look like it it's a built-in 8x8 font mmx image filters that's kind of nice to have that stuff uh, i don't want to rely on that too much but good to have in the short term i think so yeah it sounds like we just have to import this graphics primitives.h so i can try that and see if it works go back to lib.c we're going to pull in this uh sdl2 graphics primitives.h I will kill this uh, REPL, go back to VTerm. Let's just see if it builds with that uh, header pulled in. No. That's because I did not include that in the make file, I believe. I think I need to have... Um, I've had issues with this in the past, like SDL2 GFX, like the casing is different or something. In fact, I can try that out by doing package config libs sdl2 uh, gfx. That is correct. Okay, so we're going to put that. You know, uh, this is kind of stupid. Let me actually just collapse these two lines. Dash dash libs. Dash dash c flags. I think that's going to work correctly. Let me do this right here just to verify. Libs c flags. Okay, that's what I need here. Let's just make this simpler. Um, but not delete that part. Okay. So now we should be able to build with, oops, uh, both of those. Cool. That worked. All right. So now we have that, that library pulled in. I should be able to just render something. Let's just see, um, what we can do with it then. We're we'll look at the header file real quick. Uh, rectangle color, you draw it on a renderer, you give it a X and Y location for the top, I'm guessing top left point and the bottom right point, and then the color you want to use. And the color is a uint32. So I'm guessing that um, I need to use the SDL color functions, SDL color, to get an appropriate color integer. So let's see, SDL to color are in color interchangeable. Okay. But what are we, is a structure. Okay, so we just, just struct. But how can I convert that to a, an integer? Oops, let's see. Make sure I'm still playing stuff out of this playlist. I actually got um, last time uh, the video ha has a copyright claim, the previous stream, because I inadvertently played some um, remixes of Nintendo game 
theme music on the stream because Spotify just went and played whatever it wanted, which is really good. Okay, so we're going to go back to this tab. Didn't we see an example somewhere? Not there. Maybe I lost it now. We can get rid of that. Uh, get rid of that. Get rid of that. Don't need that anymore. Okay, so... Anything for colors? Get render draw color. Is that something we can use? Returns an int. Okay, so we can use this to get a drawing color. Um, that sounds like a song from a movie. So get render draw color. It returns zero on success or a negative error code. But where does it actually... Get the, oh, get the color used for... Okay, yeah, that's... Okay, it's replacing it. Let's look for the word color here. Get render draw color. Get texture color mod. All right, none of those are useful. Hmm. I had seen some, um, I think I saw some sample code, if I'm not mistaken. Extensions, external versions. Generated documentation. Uh, oh, okay, here we go. All color routines, expect the color to be in format, uh, hex format. Oh, so are we literally encoding it like hex literals in code? Wow, okay. I mean, I guess that makes sense. All color routines expect the color to be in format OX. Okay, so um, that's interesting. Plan any primitive target surface alpha is less than 255. Surface depth supported are 1, 2, 3, 4 bits per pixel. Okay. So we can try that. Um, let's go into lib.c. And we're going to try to use one of these. Whoops. We're going to try to use one of these. Uh, functions. Let's go back to the docs for graphics primitives. H. We'll do a circle. Circle color. The point, uh, the radius, and the color. So, oh, RGBA. Okay, I can actually. Okay, good. I don't need to use the the uh, color function. I can just use the RGBA variations of that. So, what we'll do is in the render loop after we clear the screen, we're also going to call. Um, circle color with, oh, is that a surface? Where's the renderer stuff? Do I need to pull a surface? Oh, no. This is the old version of the library, dude. Okay, STL2GFX. Maybe the same thing applies. That's my mistake. Okay, this is the newer one. This is the one we're looking for. That's the right place. Yeah, and it takes a renderer. So the same thing for color. Um, sorry, circle, filled circle. I actually do want filled circle. AA circle. Do is there an AA filled circle? AA filled circle. No. Filled circle. All right, filled circle RGBA. Filled circle rgba um the renderer whoops renderer the location on screen i'm going to give it an arbitrary location of 300 by uh 300 i'm going to give it an arbitrary radius of 400 
because we don't really know what we're doing. We're gonna draw it red. So 255, zero, zero, zero. Um, let's see. And then zero, zero, and 255, because we want alpha to be all the way. And uh, I forgot I need to drop this back to zeros here. All right, whoops. Let's see, go back there, insert a zero. Okay. Temp, draw a circle. So we're just gonna draw this every frame and see what happens. Uh, SDL render present. I forgot a semicolon. Build it again. And now I should be able to use control CR to start the REPL up. <clears throat> and then go to basic graphics and you do control C, control B. And now we have a circle rendering, which is great. Um, so I can't really tell if that's anti-alias. It doesn't really look like it. There's a little bit of jaggies, but it's, it's fine. I mean, we don't really need perfection at the moment. It's good enough that we have something rendering. So I think we can say that um, part of that task is complete, but we need to actually transmit this information from scheme to C before we can say that we've actually accomplished rendering something uh, based on what is in the file. The other thing is uh, if we were supposed to be able to tweak things in this file and reevaluate it, um, we need to make sure that show preview window doesn't actually do that twice. So we need some kind of global state to indicate that there is a preview window currently being displayed. But that's a problem we can deal with uh, in a moment. Uh, Gon says uh, not uh, F -F -O 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 -F -F. No, because there's actually a variant that allows you to put in the um, the integers or the uints for the individual colors. So that was a little bit nicer to use. All right, so let's see. So if I want to transmit information about things to be rendered, uh, what I probably need to do is come up with some structs in C for the different types of uh, primitives I might want to render, create them on the scheme side, and then pass them off to the renderer. So let's kind of think about how we want to accomplish that. So when I call render graphic, it has the, the scene. Let's just call that sort of the scene. There's information about the scene itself, like the width and height of what we're trying to draw. So like the image width and height. And then the set of things to be drawn on the scene. So we need to start thinking about what kind of data structure we need to pass across. So we could start with an A-list here and then render graphic itself can then translate that into structs that get sent over to C. So that's not really a problem. We could still work at a higher level here. In fact, it might actually be better in some ways so that um, if, if we're actually defining more rigid data types in scheme for this, then it reduces some of our ability to be able to do composition of stuff in um, the scheme layer. So like, you know, being able to set certain properties or that kind of thing is harder to do because you actually have to know what types you're dealing with. So I kind of want to leave things a little bit more loose, I would say on the scheme layer and then render graphic and then deal with the translation. Um, so if we were to stick with what we have now, probably need to change the instructions. And we kind of need some concepts for certain things like the, uh, the canvas. The canvas has a color. Uh, the canvas's color should be able to be animated at some point, I would think. Maybe you want to anim animate that color, so it, we need to be able to think of the canvas as something. I suppose you could always um, have a rectangle that gets rendered behind everything else. Um, which may be a decent way to deal with it, honestly, so that you can actually treat the canvas as whatever you want it to be. So it's just black, otherwise you, you can just put a rectangle behind it. But then for everything else, we need to have some kind of list of stuff for the, the scene. We can call it the scene. I, th I think I'm not gonna do this instructions approach because I'm, I'm starting to convince myself now that it's gonna be harder to, to animate things that are just instructions. You would have to be able to say for every frame, 
what the instructions are and I don't want the scheme layer to do that. So for the scene, we're going to have uh, something like, let's say, um, a circle. If we were to replicate what we just did, we need to say that it's a circle, um, maybe even say that it's a filled circle because that's what we did before. And effectively, we're just going to say it's almost going to be like a function call in a sense because we're just saying it's a filled circle. It's going to be at location 300, 300. In fact, I probably want to bump that, let's say 500, 500 now. Uh, still make it about 400 wide. And then um, we also want to express the color and it might be good if we make that be its own little list. But now we're starting to get into a scenario where um, things are a little bit more opaque. Like you don't want to have, you know, six integers that you're just passing or six numbers that you're passing in here because that would be a little bit ugly. In fact, that's going to be another one too because you need an alpha channel as well. So we need a way to express what the color is. Even say like color. Um, or, or we can have uh, explicit properties like color, I would say. I think that turns into, let's see, does Guile have the context? I'm pretty, pretty sure it has a concept of keywords. Guile keywords, symbol. I'm quite sure I've seen this before. Symbols. And uh, let's see, key, symbol keys. Symbols is lookup keys. Okay, so we're talking about a lists here, which is good. We kind of do, need, oh. Return a hash value for symbol. I like that, but that only, what? Oh, okay, it's hashing the symbol. That makes sense, okay. All right, so that's just a list. Uh, symbol props. No, that's like stashing information. Keywords, there you go. Keywords are self-evaluating objects with a convenient read syntax and makes them easy to type. Uh, why use keywords? Motivation for keyword usage. Uh -huh, this is exactly the thing that I was thinking of. Like you, you don't want to have some function that has a bunch of things that just get passed in. Um, positional parameters. So you want to have some way to actually specify them with a name. Use of keywords would be a hindrance rather than help. Oh yeah, you definitely want to put, don't want to put that cons. But I think you can use keywords just arbitrarily. Get keyword value. Okay, yeah. So make window is basically got a rest uh, pr argument list called args, and then they're processing the uh, keyword arguments by using get keyword value, which they've done here. Um, KV mem q keyword args. That's kind of a very inefficient way to do it, but I mean, what choice do you have really? Okay, so I think that maybe that's a good way to do this to make it more flexible. So um, I could do something like uh, position 500, 500. I know this is a, not super, it doesn't look nice to type, but uh, we can probably find some ways to uh, polish this a little bit with syntax in scheme if we decide we need to. So that's a reasonable way to do that. I'll go ahead and delete this whole um, instructions list. All right, so now we have a scene uh, with a filled circle, position 500, 500, radius 400, color 255, 0, 0, and uh, alpha of 255. Uh, Crazy Chicken says quargs over args. I think it's a Python thing, right? Basically saying it's better to use keyword args so that uh, intention is better understood. So this is a good starting point, I think. So what we need now is for render graphic to be able to <clears throat> translate uh, this filled circle into a C struct. So um, to accomplish that, we're gonna need a struct on the C side. And uh, I don't have solid recollection of uh, defining structs in C, so we're just gonna uh, try to see what this 
what we can do with this. I think um, C language define struct. There's sort of like the type def thing you have to do, <clears throat> excuse me, in C to actually give a name to a struct correctly. <clears throat> struct books book. Yes, that's right, because you can sort of do this in line. I don't care about that. Struct books book one. Maybe not. Maybe it's fine. <clears throat> struct circle. Hmm. I wonder if it's better to actually transmit the color as a single um, value to pass in like some of these color functions want in the drawing library. <clears throat> All right, so let's go with this first. So um, <clears throat> the actual types that are being used in the primitives library. Let's, oh, this is the wrong one, isn't it? No, that's the right one. Okay, so build circle. S int 16. What is an S int in this case? Probably coming from um, SDL. Probably just some kind of type def. SDL S int 16. Oh, it's a signed integer. Maybe that's what it means. Okay, S int 16. We wouldn't want to use. Oh, we do want to use a signed integer there because we're giving it a position. Ah, short. But that's lowercase, right? Let's just see. S int 16. Doesn't highlight that. Hmm. Probably that it will compile though. Let's try, let's try this. X. Ah, okay. I think it's highlighting because of the uh, semantics. So S at 16 for X and Y. We also need the uh, radius. Where was that? Uh, rad, okay. S int 16 radius. I want to be a little bit more clear about that. And then the color. So we could have a color struct, actually. So let's say struct color core um s int 16 i think they're using that also right oh yeah oh no you int you int 8 that makes sense you int 8 that makes a lot of sense okay so r g b a Okay, so now I can actually have a color here. And I'm not going to make that a pointer because there's really no point. I can just assign a color directly in. It's, everything's going to be packed into this struct um, directly, which is good. And now that I have both of these, in theory, I should be able to create those from Scheme. I just need to look up the documentation for how to do that correctly. Uh, first of all, maybe I should actually compile this and see if it gives me any problems. Okay, so unknown type name color expected. Oh yeah, I forgot my semicolons. I've, you know, like I said, I'm not fully up to speed on C syntax, it's been a while. Unknown type name color, yeah. I think that's what I was expecting to see. There's a problem Using that as a, a struct color, that is. Oh, you're right. Okay, that's why type defs are actually necessary, is so that you don't have to use struct in front. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. So, what is the type def uh, syntax? Is it just putting it at the end of the struct def, or is that something else? Type def struct, maybe? I think that was right. Type def struct uh, color type. I don't know. Uh, color. And then type def struct. If I remember this correctly, circle. I need to fix the circle type. 
All right, that worked. Um, alrighty. So we have those two now that compiles, which is great. And now let's go back and look at the documentation in uh, ski, uh, sorry, uh, Guile. Foreign types. We have that. Uh, foreign pointers. Let's look at the foreign function interface. Foreign structs, packing and unpacking structs. Make C struct types values. Okay, so um, this is what we can use to basically create an instance of a struct because um, the thing about structs in C is that they are basically just an arrangement of the information that you put in a struct in memory in the order that you defined the list of properties. So anything that's nested in there, if it's actually like a um, a nested struct type, like in this case, color is sort of like in line in that parent struct of circle type. Uh, the color type struct will be sort of just at the end. So the first would be the X, the second would be the Y, then radius, then color, uh, all four of the values in color. So to I think basically all I need to do is create in memory um, the same sequence of values with the same type so that the, the bytes are the same length for every field. Then the C program should be able to read those in. Now the problem is, uh, how do we identify what type something is? I guess that's something that could stay outside of the circle type itself. I don't really want to be um, dealing with that. So probably what we need is some um, way, uh, uh, an integer of some sort, an unsigned integer that we can use to identify types of shapes or types of things that can be drawn. Um, let's see, let's say like a define uh, shape color equals uh, Two. It's completely arbitrary. I don't have. I, I need to, you know, come up with a better strategy for this, but there's something we can do. The right stack order, Gon says. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, if it actually has to do with the call stack or if it's just something, uh, some other terminology that I'm not familiar with in that uh, context. So uh, we can check the. Um, the value of a shape that's being sent through. So I think basically what we would need is a way to say uh, for each thing that we're going to draw, uh, what is the shape or what is the type? Oops, not color. Type uh, filled circle. And maybe there's like a, a bit flag we could put on there to say whether it's filled or not in some cases. So um, we need for uh, for each thing in the scene we need to know a uh, type of thing to draw and uh, the specific uh, struct of properties for the the thing to be drawn so um we will probably also need let's see what would I call that scene member I don't know you int uh, type Probably should be more specific about that. Let's call it a uint32. And I guess uh, I should probably use this capital U type there just to make the SDL stuff happy. I don't really need to do that, but it seems weird to be inconsistent. So we'll do that for now. And then we need to have um, basically a pointer. For now, it could just be a void pointer to uh, props. I don't know. That way we can have anything, uh, be pulled out of there. And the way that we interpret that props variable is dependent on the type of, uh, scene member, I guess you could call it. So the scheme layer would have to 
uh, create both the props struct and then this uh, scene member struct, fill in the type, and then just pass in that um, that object as the properties object. That should be appropriate, I think. Let's see, do we have any, let me check something really quick. Yeah, making sure that I'm not showing my green screen corner again. All right, so what we could try to do is um, at least try to create a circle. I mean, I don't know if there's a good way to verify this other than just seeing it get rendered. So if we were to write code that could uh, that could deal with this, we probably also need a, let's see, type def struct a scene type. We're just having to sort of sketch this out as best we can. I missed that uh, scene member. Probably not the best name for that. Um, so you went 32 um, count or member count, I would say, because we need to know how many members we have. And we also need basically an array of uh, members. So we're going to need. An array of, uh, is it going to be, no, it would be pointers, but actually be an array, I think, of scene members. So scene member uh, members. But uh, since we don't actually have a, yeah, since we don't actually have, we don't know the number in advance, we can't compile it that way. So I think we need to have a pointer just to say, this is the start location in memory for the the array of members that has this many members uh, included. So that should give us the ability to do a loop. And we could have something like, ah, I need to finish this scene. And we could have a scene star current scene uh, equals zero because we want it to be, I don't know if that's gonna, even gonna compile. Maybe I should just say null, right? Does null exist in C? Yeah, yeah, probably so. That way, if there's a scene, we can try to render it. So we can comment that out. In fact, we can test this out this side on this side of the code by just like putting something together really quickly, uh, temporary scene and trying it out. I think that might be a, a good way to to verify this. So what we'll do is say um, for, and I haven't written for loops in C in a long time, so draw the scene. So we'll see how this goes. Um, int i equals zero. Oh, no. First we need to check to see if current scene is not e equal to null. You can see me doing some JavaScript there. Um, I is less than current scene um, member, what is that? Member count. Where did I just go? Member count. Uh, I plus plus, okay. So now we would be able to render whatever shows up here. So I could probably say, well, honestly, we probably want to render scene function. So let's just drop one in here really quickly. Void render scene. Uh, we're going to need the SDL. Okay, so we got to declare it outside of the for loop. We'll, we'll check it out in a second. SDL renderer, uh, renderer, and then um, scene pointer, scene. All right, so we'll do it this way. We're gonna level up our C, uh, C skills here over time. Render scene, uh, renderer. Oh, I need to do the check on that actually. Just drop that back, back really quickly. We're gonna do this actually, okay. Renderer uh, current scene. That way it's a little bit more functional, I guess you could say. And 
then go up to render scene, drop it here. Okay. That's okay in modern C? Okay, hopefully it works with GCC here. That'd be great. All right, so now we have a for loop that we should be able to use for uh, looping over the members of the scene and then trying to draw them out. And we're gonna have to um, have a switch probably on the type of member and call into various functions for that, which is not a problem. So void render filled circle. Uh, and we're going to need the SDL renderer. And then the uh, circle star circle. And then we'll just let that be there for now. Uh, we can have a switch here, I think. Let me double check that switch syntax. Yep, basically what I expected it to be. Um, one second. Let me just check on something. Okay, so switch um, current scene members I dot. Yeah, I want to maybe double check that, make sure it's not something wrong. Yeah, it's probably fine. Let's just leave it like that for now. If we start getting crashes, we'll just, you know, throw in GDB. All right, so member count uh, members. We want to check type. All right, so type is what we're looking for. Dot type. I'm curious if the compiler is going to start yelling at me for stuff here because it's been a while since I've actually tried to do a lot of this. Um, okay, so uh, now we want to check the switch value. So we're going to check the case. Case. And what do we call it there? Type filled circle. Type filled circle. Um... And then if it's the case, we're gonna say render filled circle, renderer current scene members I. Um, I might have to cast this, but this is gonna be a void pointer. I need to figure out the right uh, pointer conversion to do there. What I call it? Props? So we're going to pass props in, and I don't know if it's automatically going to convert to the right uh, type. In fact, maybe we should just try to build this and see what happens. <clears throat> and probably need to throw a break in there just for good measure. I don't like this indentation. All right, so let me try to uh, build this again. All right, cool. Expected expression before colon... Oh, yeah, all right, so I use an equal sign there, which is obviously not right. And I don't know if I need that semicolon. I think defined statements don't need that. Okay, so that did actually compile, which is good. Whether it runs or not, I don't know. All right, let's see. Int A, int B, reading Gon's comment. Okay, so um, that compiled, which is a good sign. So what I wanted to do let me actually pull this back. I'm going to drop this right up here. Uncomment that. We have the renderer. Uh, we need the uh, circle.x. Oh, this is actually it needs to be dereferenced. Circle x, circle y circle radius and then we need uh, the color information as well I think I can just say color color so I don't have to type out all, the, out all that stuff um, circle color or maybe even use a pointer not sure if that's the best approach here because I think we're doing a copy of that which probably is not great but uh, we'll leave it for now What's the best way to do multi-line functions? Ugh. All right, so color.r, color.r, dot 
g color dot b and color dot a okay so that is enough in theory let's try to compile it again see if it complains okay no complaints so far i i'm skeptical <laughs> of whether that's actually going to work or not but uh we'll, we'll see in a moment um so to make a temporary test scene i think i can do some of this stuff in line if i'm not mistaken but i, I don't remember so um c create struct in line how to sign a c struct in line so i could t i could potentially do this syntax i think initialize a struct in c Okay, whatever. Recommended cookies. I do not like how this looks. My type. Oh, you can use the same name. Okay, that's cool. Good to know. Which C is this? Is this? Okay, I'll just try this anyway. That's pretty useful. Person me. assignment list notation ah okay all right cool so i might be able to do that in line individual assignment don't really want to do that let's try this and see what happens so um we'll comment that out for a second and then for this we are going to say i think it infers the type here right Okay, so we're gonna say member count and is equals one. Let's drop this down to the next line maybe. Okay, member count one dot members. I think it's fine to do this. Let's see, uh, C, or, whoa, C array initialization. All right. Okay, so int y has type int five. Okay, this might work. So how about I do members equals, whoops. Do I have to do nested? Yeah, okay, that, that, that could be nested. All right, so I think this needs to be the curly braces. And then um scene member so we need the, the member struct so if i say well it let's see if it figures it out let's let's try this uh dot type equals type build circle and then uh we want to have uh props equals circle dot uh, x equals 500 dot y equals 500 dot radius equals 400 dot color equals and then we're going to put in the values for that one here dot r we're gonna make this red. R equals 255 dot uh, G equals zero dot B equals zero dot A equals 255. I don't know if this is gonna work. Okay. Didn't like something. Field name not in record or union initializer. So member count, do I, do I need to say, let's see, can I, can I actually initialize a pointer this way? Maybe what I actually have to do is initialize it like it's an array and have that be like the only entry in the array. 
Let's see if that works. All right. Braces around scalar initializer. You assign to a pointer. I know. Uh, I'm hoping I can fake it into uh, thinking it's an array, but I don't know if it's going to work that way. Not a struct. Yeah, but the current scene itself. Well, okay. How about this? How about this? That's a good way to do it. So scene, uh, test scene. Here's what we'll do. Now, this is still C. All right, so I'm going to drop that. I'm going to drop that. I'll go put this back down to the uh, previous level. And then I'll move this line. And I will um, set the current scene to the reference of test scene. So let's try that and see if it likes it better. Probably still going to complain about something. All right. Races around scalar initializers. So do I need to be explicit about the fact that this is a scene? Or is that li the, um, the code I saw actually telling me the wrong thing? Person me equals. Interesting that it's not working. How to assign a C struct in line. Counter T C. So maybe I just leave off the. Uh, That member is also a pointer. Ooh. I can't do that at all. It seems annoying, but okay. Let's let's do this. Let's just take this one out. Scene member. Yeah, we're gonna have to deal with a couple of things. Test member uh, equals. So let's just drop that there. We'll put this on the next line and then Pull these over a couple of levels. Put a semicolon after. Ah, uh, hmm. Yeah, okay. That's possible, Mr. Bill. Okay, so members. So we're going to initialize the scalar here in theory. And we're going to have a test member in there. I don't know if that's going to work, but. The rest of this is, well, that's also a, mm. can I do that? Let's just try it. I don't know. This is becoming a little bit of a mess. I don't know if there's a better way to do it just as a function. Hey, thanks Sky Vault Games. I checked out your YouTube channel. Your, your channel is pretty cool too. All right. Type filled circle undeclared type filled. Did I, I need to move that out to the top. Yeah, probably so. Let's put it here. All right, so that part is happy about now. Expect expected expression before uh, curly brace token. Let me think. So uh, what we'll do is... Come on now. Uh, C initialize struct pointer. Initialize a struct pointer. Yeah, you gotta use malloc. Who wants to do that? C pointer destruction C structs with pointers. I want an initializer. C in struct initializer, struct pointer initializer. Initialize the values of a struct pointer. Cost. Okay. Yeah. Sure.
with this Val. Oh, there yeah, some C++ stuff. Aggregate initialization to construct it. Okay. Aggregate initialization. That sounds helpful. Is that only for C++? Doesn't help me. Uh, C language aggregate initialization. I'm not going to spend too much more time on this. C language. Pointer? No. Ah, pointer. Anything about pointers? No. Okay. Type def struct, okay. And one, two, three. Triplet. So that's a that's a known size for that list. There's no pointer there. All right. Uh, let's see. I mean, I may have to do just a little bit of memory allocation to uh, try this. And the question is, is it better just to try to do it from the um, the scheme side to test this? I'm trying to think of which one is going to take more time. I would think probably <laughs> trying to make this work in uh, C may take more time. Let's uh, let's switch over to the scheme side. Let's go back to four instructs and I think we can make a couple helper functions for uh, creating these things. So let's go over to uh, graphics.scm. We're going to have to move some of this stuff out into another library at some point, but for now we'll deal with this. Define make uh, filled circle. Uh, might be able to make this API a little bit better, but uh, that's fine for now. And for make filled circle, we're going to give it a spec. So in our basic graphics at SCM, we have this spec. So I'm going to call it a spec just for the sake of, uh, it's a specification for what the circle is. We're, t we're giving it a spec, which is a list of, uh, property value pairs, basically, or keyword value pairs. Um, yeah, it's not exactly an A list. It's more like a P list. So we're just going to chop the front off this list and then pass it into uh, make filled circle. I need to cast it first. Okay. I could try to go back to that, but let's just make a little progress here instead. Cause I think uh, I would rather have the actual code written than just try to hack some things together. So here we are going to um, use make C struct. I wonder if there's a shorthand for this also, like if we can define like a foreign struct or if I just need to write something like that for myself. Could be that there is some, um, let's see, convenience routines to support conven conventionally packed structs, but giving the byte vector pointer, one could create and parse tightly packed structs and unions. I mean, I'm guessing that we're dealing with conventionally packed structs right now. Um, so we need to go back to the foreign types list to see which types we have to work with. Uh, and the, we have int 16, the, uh, no, which one is it? Okay. Int 16. So signed int 16, I think is what we're going to be using. Because in the structs that we define in the C library, or at least for circle type, is uh, signed int 16. So back in graphics at SCM, we're going to say make C struct with a, a list of. Uh, int 16. And another int 16. 
and uh, another N16, and then a color. So I wonder how we can deal with the uh, nested color struct if there's like some way to build these up. I mean, for now, obviously, we would just make a C struct that has only those specific um so what is it the uint 8 and i think we have that in we haven't switched buffers too much okay uint 8 i have that here so we're gonna go back to graphics uh uint 8 uint 8 uint 8 uint 8 we have four Uh, uint 8s in the color type. So we have uh, three uh, signed int 16s, and then for color, we have uh, four uint 8s. So that's what we have here. I'm guessing that this is going to work. I don't know for sure, but we'll figure it out. Uh, so make filled circle spec. So we're going to have to pull out all the information from that to get the values, but uh, we're just going to, you know, hack it for now. So let. <clears throat> we're going to let the uh, X equals 500. We're going to continue on with what we were doing before. Uh, y is 500. You can get the address of a stack allocated struct. Yeah, I, I would imagine so. But I'm not worried about it right now. I think it's better just uh, focus on making something work. Or at least getting getting close to having the pieces put together, I would say. Uh, radius 400. And then also we need the uh, the colors. R, 255, G, 0, B, 0, A, uh, 255. So then in this, make C struct, I'm going to have another list as a second parameter, which is the actual list of uh, X, Y, radius, R, G, B, A. And in theory, uh, that should work. All right, so that's make filled circle. Uh, obviously, we have to know that we're dealing with a uh, filled circle. So uh, we're going to need to loop through <clears throat> the uh, list of scene members. Go to basic graphics. And for each of these, we're going to look at the first uh, symbol or the first atom, I guess you could say, in the list and see what it says and then uh, dispatch based on that. So for render graphic, we can uh, consult the A list for scene. So uh, let scene, um, let's see, there was a, I don't remember the, is it a, a suck or something like that? A-S-S-O-C that is the function for that. So let's go to index. Association lists, GL. Um, retrieving A-list entries. Uh, okay, so. Uh, return the first entry in the A-list with a given key. Return the, oh, okay, return the value from the first entry. Okay, so uh, I think we want uh, ASOC ref. Probably the Q one would work too, since we're dealing with symbols. But I don't know, let's just use this one for now, just to make sure, I'm not sure. And the A list is the first value, so we're gonna put it passing graphic, and then the uh, symbol is the second one, so we're gonna look for scene. So that should give us the list of uh, scene members. And then we're just basically looking at each of them to determine uh, what we're dealing with. So um, scheme is interesting when it comes to loops because um, you're really dealing with things using recursion often. So I think I, I don't really want to deal with recursion right now, but uh, let's see. Guile scheme loops. Let's see what uh, Guile has in terms of uh, looping. 
iterators and for loops with guile scheme. Actually, don't we want to use map? Can we do that? Hmm. Or, I mean, really, we just need a, a function that's like make scene. And the question is, if you use map to loop over the list of uh, of scene, how do you then put it together at the end? If if you're returning, what what does this actually return? This uh, make C struct or instructs parse C struct um, is returning a foreign pointer to a C struct. So. When we have a pointer, we're gonna have basically a, a scheme list of C pointers. And then we wanna turn that into um, a, con well, we can't really turn it into a contiguous array. So, cause it wasn't structured like that. Hmm. Yeah, that one might take a little bit of thought to get the right approach. There's uh, the byte vector. Pointer to byte vector routines. So maybe um, if we take a look at the byte vector code, if we can look at the index, let's see if it's in the index. Byte vector. Byte vectors. I could probably just dump them in into a single byte vector. It feels a little bit uh, inefficient. Especially if the memory needs to be freed after the fact. Byte vector is a raw bit string. Um, contains a procedure to manipulate byte vectors and interpret their contents in various sizes and Indianness. Byte vectors as integer lists. Uh, byte vectors as arrays manipulated with the array procedures okay so that's not exactly what I want creating copying and manipulating byte vectors and there was the pointer to byte vector function that we had seen um, let's like actually look for that and see if it has any docs pointer to no pointer All right, let's, let's actually look at that then. Void pointers and byte access. Ah, here it is, pointer to byte vector. Return a byte vector aliasing the length bytes point to two by pointer. So given a memory address, you can get a byte vector back. Um, so long as you know the length of the memory inside of the pointer. So you're basically copying that. Well, that seems kind of wasteful, to be honest. So, hmm. it's almost like you need to compose the entire huh, struct list. So um, I don't know if that's even possible, but if you could compile this entire list of values or of types and entire list of values from the entire list of objects that you're trying to do and just sort of treat it as if it's one struct just like write it out to a single uh location in memory and hoping that it's going to match up correctly with the structs and the arrays whenever you read it back and see that might be better than trying to like do individual objects and then trying to stitch them back together with a couple of different memory copies. There must be a more efficient way to do that. Wrapped pointer type. To wrap pointer objects into scheme objects with a disjoint type. Ah. I think I'd seen that before. Oh, 
bottle of A, bottle contents. Okay. Most object-oriented C libraries use pointers to specific data structures to identify objects. It's useful in such cases to reify the different pointer types as dis disjoint scheme types. And what is bottle? Question mark. Byte vector uint ref. Okay. Interesting. I'm trying to think if there's any like shorter path to get there. Obviously, we can write the code that is probably not the most ideal for this purpose. Um, meaning not very processor hey felipe not very processor and memory efficient uh and you know sometimes it's better to just write the crap code that you know is crap first and get it working and then try to fix it so i might have to do that next time because i'm not convinced there's a way to do this in a more efficient way just yet So let me let me grab some links really quickly because you know this is kind of some interesting stuff that people might want to take a look at related to uh, Guile. So that's a good one. Um, the general foreign function interface, top level information is good. Uh, foreign functions we're using, and we're also using foreign structs. Okay. So uh, let's let's go back and look at our, our set of tasks. Uh, get something rendering to the screen. I mean, I guess you could say we did that, but it's sort of cheating to say that we accomplished this. So um, get something rendering, something simple rendering uh, in the C code. We did that for sure. Get something rendering on the screen. Uh, well, I mean, I guess technically speaking, we did that. Because then we're talking about transmit drawing instructions to the renderer th thread in some form. And that's th something we have not gotten to yet. Uh, get the basic graphics work example working is not working yet. Uh, this is probably fairly easy to do, but we'll save it for next time as a sort of way to, to cap off, you know, this effort if we actually get it working. Uh, this is not happening anymore, so I don't know. I'll just call that done because technically it's not happening. So let's just leave it as that. All right, so next steps. Okay, Gon is giving a suggestion. If you want to init a pointer to a struct, you can use dot pointer equals. Ah. Okay, cool. I might have to try that uh, next time. I can't actually copy it because I'm seeing the chat on a different machine right now. But um, we might need to have a way to test this code on the C side to make sure that it works correctly before we start trying to send things over from Scheme because we might get completely uh, unexpected results. So, uh, so to do, um, try to finish. Uh, instantiating a test scene in C, use Gan's uh, example. Uh, transmit drawing function instructions in render thread in some form. So first we need to um, figure out how to uh, create the C struct representation for scene objects in Scheme. Transmit drawing instructions to the renderer. I think that one's going to be pretty easy. Yeah, I, I'm not worried about that one. I think that that's going to be really easy because we don't really have to worry too much about uh, thread locking per se. Yeah, we might use like an SDL event to trigger it, like to flip it. Yes, we could have a, like the next scene and then have an event that, that uh, 
that triggers it. That way we can make sure that the loop does not get interrupted whenever it's rendering. So we can say that. And then once all this stuff works, the basic graphics example should work. Um, and we also want to make sure that um, uh, make sure that we can re-eval the uh, scheme code to update the live preview. Uh, that's going to be important so that we actually can interactively edit the graphic as we're building it and see the results. Um, and that's sort of the whole point of doing this is having the ability to um, use Scheme as a language to describe a creative work and have it be created or, and actually be able to, to interactively develop it um, using the power of Scheme and also just using whatever, you know, uh, whatever you have in mind. And then once you're done with it, you could then just render it out to whatever file you like uh, and basically save it as a scheme file and then use that as a script effectively with the a compose program to write out the file uh, that you want in the end. So yeah, I don't know. I feel like we did make some progress today. At least we got the, we, we did some reorganization of code a little bit and we got the um, the, the shared library working so that we can call into the init graphics function and actually have it working to show the SDL window and have things rendering on the screen, not coming from Scheme yet, but just the C code that renders to the screen, which is great. So everything's in place to figure out how to transmit the information from Scheme to C and then have C have the necessary logic to render whatever is being uh, given to it. So next time, hopefully, I might do a little bit of research after the stream before next week so that I can um, have a solution at hand and start implementing it so we don't have to spend too much time, you know, scratching our heads again. Uh, so basically all we try to do is figure out the right way to structure the uh, in-memory C struct representation that we create on the scheme side and see if I can make sure that it actually can be used in C. And then once we have that, then we can do pretty much anything. We can start building from there and um, understanding how to do the rest of the code. So uh, I think for the first week, I'm fairly happy with it. I think that, you know, we're making progress towards a useful result. Hopefully by the end of next week, we'll actually be able to start building some interesting looking uh, scenes uh, that I could potentially start using for thumbnails. I mean, a couple of things I need for that are displaying images or rendering images and also re rendering text, which is always kind of a problem uh, because if you want to use fonts, then you have to use free type. And uh, sometimes free types not so great or renderers for free type aren't so great. You know, you get a lot of aliasing and whatnot. So uh, we're going to look into that a little bit and see if we can make it nicer. And um, yeah, then maybe I can start to use it to generate thumbnails, which would be awesome for me. I would love to be able to generate thumbnails from this program and not have to make them by hand in the GIMP all the time because that's that it doesn't take a whole lot of time but it's more than I would like to spend. And it's very fiddly because I have to do a lot of things manually. So it'd be nice to not have to do that anymore. All right, folks, uh, thank you so much. Those of you who have been here, um, uh, both streams this week and anybody who showed up today for the first time, thank you very much for, for, for joining. Uh, there will be a System Crafter stream tomorrow. I know it's New Year's Eve, but for the folks who are interested in joining a System Crafter stream, it will be at the normal time on the System Crafters channel. Uh, I think we're going to be doing sort of like a recap of 2021 and talk about what our goals are, you know, for our system crafting for myself and for you uh, in uh, 2022 and maybe talk about some of the things we'll talk, we'll do on the channel in 2022 as well, because I've already been thinking about that. So uh, anyway, thanks a lot again, everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to try to cut together a summary video of this week for the people who weren't able to watch. We'll see how that turns out. I don't know how it's going to work with all this music in the background, but... Uh, we'll give it a shot. Anyway, thanks a lot for being here today. And uh, until next time, keep it creative and we'll see you.